don't know if he was has that. Greetings, everybody at home and uh, around the country. Those of you that are tuning in today live, welcome. And those of you that will be watching this later, welcome as well. So we are going to be doing a program today called Qigong and Meditation. Qigong is actually a form of meditation. So in some ways it's redundant, but we're going to get a little more specific about it. Um, for those of you who maybe are meeting me for the first time, I'm the author of Qigong for Beginners, Your Path to Greater Health and Vitality. Uh, Qigong has made a lot of uh, change and differences in my life and helped me to heal an array of different things. You can read about that or hear more about that later. Uh, I just want to, we'll put that out there for now. I want to share with you many different tools today to actually heal yourself, to transform different conditions, so on and so forth. We'll get into the philosophy and the theory a little bit later. Let's jump in. I want to say thank you to the Love, Peace, Amen Foundation for sponsoring this particular program today. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, I know that some of their representatives uh, enjoyed it, and that's why they want to share it with you. So without further ado, let's practice a little Qigong, and then we'll get a little more into the details. we got two hours uh, we're going to build upon every minute that we have here today to give you the best result that we can give you. So without further ado, I'm going to step back. I got a couple of my uh, teachers over here who are also going to be moving and doing some of these techniques. So hopefully, if I'm not doing it right, they will. <laughs> All right. Most likely, I'm going to do it right. But they're going to give you a little, uh, a little view, a little different angle so that you can follow along. OK, this is Carrie over here. And this is Keith over here. Wave, say hello, guys. Keith. Okay, here we go. And if something comes up along the way for some reason, you guys can't hear me. I mean, we have tech people, uh, my wife and daughter primarily, our, our tech crew uh, at, at home and so on, making sure that you guys can hear us the whole time and so forth. But if for any reason something comes up and you're like, wow, all of a sudden, you know, five of you can't hear me, just go ahead and send me a little text and... Uh, We'll get it going. All right. I'm going to take my watch off. If you have a watch on, you might want to take your watch off just for comfort. If you have anything in your pockets, you may want to take it out of your pockets uh, because there's certain movements and things that we're going to do um, that are going to be a, might be a little bumpy. So we just start off by rubbing our hands together, just a gentle warming up practice here. Okay. I have a lot to tell you, but we're going to take it a piece at a time have a lot to share, many pieces, many tools. I've been doing Qigong now for approximately 40 years. So I also have a background in psychology, a background in molecular cellular biology, a background with uh, some emergency medicine practices, um, black belts in three different martial arts and other advanced studies of martial arts. So uh, background, extensive background in traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, I'm what's called a medical Qigong master. Medical Qigong is considered the father of acupuncture. So needless to say, I probably have some tricks of the trade that I want to share with you. Uh, things that I've learned along the way to heal myself, to de-stress, which is a form of healing in and of itself. And uh, with medical Qigong, we're also going to get into some specifics, which I think is really important. Specifics to bring about healing for certain conditions, certain things you might be wrestling with. And that is one of the primary differences between this type of Qigong and other forms of Qigong. Medical Qigong gets very specific. And I've learned a lot of tricks along the way, and I'd like to share them with you. So I'm going to take that energy now, imagine, and just like water, we're going to just shake it off and kind of put it toward the floor. Now, with your fingers, I also recommend you kind of like with your thumb, it's like this flicking motion, like you're flicking off water. So not only am I going like this, but I'm also doing this flicking motion here. Your arms are extremities, okay? But as you're going like this, you're clearing those extremities. I'll show you later. We're going to go like this now. We're doing a little, it's just a little shake like this. A light shaking motion like this, okay, without even getting too woo-woo about it, okay? 
this is very good for your lymphatic system. Okay, so just a light shake. Anytime you're doing a light shake like this, very good for the lymphatic system. Now, this time, the backs of the hands on the pants. This is why I was gonna, this is why I told you to not have anything in your pockets, because this kind of hurts if you forget and you hit your keys or something. <laughs> so, so this is just patting your hands now. Okay. And if you could imagine for a moment that. Somehow you're like an energy field or a cloud for a moment, something like that. And when you're doing this with the extremities, imagine like the dirt is coming off. Like you're getting a, like a dark cloud cover here kind of thing. So you're going here like this. This also, by the way, when you elevate your hands and your arms like this, this brings a greater blood flow to what? What part of your body carry does this bring a greater blood flow to? Arms. That's right. It brings a greater blood flow to the heart. And then brush, two, three, four, five. Now, to put your arms straight up, if you had high blood pressure, that's somewhat dangerous, actually. But a, a elevation like this is perfectly fine if you have a little bit of high blood pressure, even if you have a lot of high blood pressure. This brings the energy actually back down toward the heart as long as your hands are at about this elevation. If you were to put your arms up toward the sky, you're creating higher blood pressure. That's not a good idea if you have high blood pressure. Now, look. Where do the arms come? They come down here and the blood goes down in this direction. So does the energy. So something to think about. All right. We're going to do that one more time, maybe two more times. I kind of feel out the group here, try and feel what the energy is doing and uh, go with what feels best to me, which I will be doing here all day today, or at least for the next couple hours. Two, three, four and five. Now, plant your feet just under your shoulders, and even if they're already there, kind of one step, two step, and then take your feet, and at first, we're going to exaggerate this. Later, it's not quite as exaggerated, but imagine that you're screwing that foot into the floor, and then you're screwing that foot into the floor. That is called uh, becoming rooted, like having roots, like roots of a tree. And then from here, bend your knees slightly and also tuck your uh, buttocks just in your pelvis slightly forward so that if I were to take my hand back here and put it on my tailbone, that rather than it sticking out that way, I want to imagine like I'm plugging it down into the floor, just a little bit. That's all, just a little, okay? From this position here, when I bend the knees and I come to this position, I'm now going to let the hands drop here, and we're going to let them hang here for just a moment. So this is another practice of uh, meditation and de-stress in and of itself. Lift the hands, let them drop and touch your legs. People who have uh, a lot of stress in the shoulders, it's very good. This is like a trick of the mind. You lift the hands. Now that takes some effort, right? but then completely let the effort go. This can trick the brain into relaxing. So you lift and drop, lift and drop. Now I'm gonna do the same thing, but I'm gonna lift to the front and drop. I let my hands just gently tap my thighs. So we're gonna go sides, drop, front, drop, sides, drop, front, drop, okay? Now, from this position, we're going to roll the shoulders backward. Be careful with that, nothing too hard or serious. Just roll them backwards, whatever's comfortable. I'm also gonna use my elbows, my elbows. It's gonna feel maybe a little weird at first, you're not used to it. Pulling with my elbows and coming back. Elbows and coming back. Elbows, now I'm just gonna do one, one side. And now, rather than pulling with the shoulder, I'm going to pull more with the elbow. So like if I was pulling something, I'm, my elbow's coming high like this, and I'm coming around. So I'm going to go two, three, four, 
five. I'm going to do the same thing with the other side. Now, again, I'm not pulling too much with my shoulder anymore. I'm not rolling the shoulder anymore as much. This is like, if we go back to this just for a second, this is like really rolling the shoulders. Okay. This here, I just want to use the elbow now. Elbow, elbow, pulling this way, pulling this way. Now, both elbows, elbows. And this comes sometimes, you'll hear uh, the teaching or the reference or the analogy of pulling silk or reeling silk. You have a little thing of silk and you're reeling it. So one and two and three and four. And as I'm doing this, there's also, if I'm going to my right, there's a little bit of turning in my pelvis, a little bit of turning my pelvis that direction, a little bit of turning my pelvis the other direction. And I'm pulling with that elbow, this is where I want you to put your attention is to the elbow itself there for now, as opposed to shoulder and a little bit of pelvis tilt. And we're moving some energy. You may notice that this is starting to shift your breathing pattern a little bit. Some of you may notice that. Some of you may also notice that this is starting to shift your saliva. In fact, I can hear Someone can hear clearing their throat just a little bit because that's the sinuses, that's the throat. It's already working to create what? What is called rest and digest. So I'm going to do this a couple more times, a little bit more here. One, two, three, four. Don't worry about what your breathing is or isn't. Just observe it. Then let your hands come back to this still position. When we're standing like this in a Qigong practice, in general, this is called standing tree meditation. You'll notice this bush we have over here behind Keith. This is stand, the bush is there, and but the bush is like standing like a tree. Now, we're going to add one other element here. And standing tree meditation is a form of, as I said, meditation. So check this out. If you have this stance, good. The knees are bent. The tailbone's tucked in, so on. You let the arms drop. We did this version first. Side, front, side. Now check this out. We're going to do something interesting. It's interesting on the level that it is. We're going to open up the armpits. Notice the elbows come up a little bit. I don't want you to do this. That's shrugging the shoulders. It's just opening up your armpits as if you're holding a little ball, maybe the size of your fist, typically smaller, maybe a, an egg or something. And you're holding like this. So you can look at Carrie's version, Keith's version here, as well as mine. And we're roughly doing a similar thing. Our hands, our palms are pointed toward our body. Now to begin with, this is going to cause some of you tension in the shoulders. So we're going to work with that to eliminate it. Roll the shoulders, scrunch them up, not too hard, just a little, and then let them drop. Come back to this position, and we're not going to hold this one for very long, although 20 minutes of this practice is a very powerful meditation. We do not start there. So be very still for a moment, and take the tip of your tongue and place the tip of your tongue behind your two front teeth and gently touch it there. I'm gonna have you take, let's say 10 breaths, in through the nose, out through the nose, very gentle breaths, no rush, 10 breaths, Pulling not only breath in through your nose, but we also talk about, while you're breathing, just listen to this idea. We talk about chi rides on the breath. That's how it would be said in ancient Taoist practice. But in Western science, we also know that there is electromagnetism in the air, and it also holds and houses information. It also holds and houses what they say in China, what they call in China, life force or chi. And in India, they call it prana. Okay. And in other regions of Asia, they call it ki. 
this is all the same similar idea. So in Japan, they talk about ki as opposed to chi, but same idea. Okay, finish out your last breath there. Very good. Step out of that position. We're going to do a light tapping, a light tapping. Okay. And we're going to tap back here along the sacrum and along the buttocks. And we're going to tap down the sides of the legs. And we're going to stay here for just a moment where we're slightly bent over and we're tapping the sides of our legs. And we come back up and we go back down just to the knees. And we come back up. And we go back down and we come back up and we go back down and we come back up. We go back to the sacrum area and we go back down to the deviants and we come back up. Now we're going to go past the knees down the outsides of the shins, wherever you can reach there. Be, pump, be uh, careful. Come up the inside of your legs, tapping. Go around to the outside and go back down. Come back up to the inside and go back down. Coming back up as long as it's comfortable to do and go back down. And we're going to do it two more times. There's one, and here comes the second one. And slowly come up, bring your head up, go right back to this position. You're going to feel it. You might feel a little like, whoa. So that's why when we come back to this position, boom, bend the knees a little bit. Hold your mind to your feet. That is going to take practice. It is initially an idea. It is a, an idea of meditation. It is an idea of mindfulness. Most people, when they first begin doing it, because of certain conditions, especially that we have here in the West, so letting the arms fall, you can either hold with a little bit of openness, or for right now, you can even let those hang. I'll let you do either one, okay? Again, this is our standing tree meditation. Holding the mind to the feet is a practice of mindfulness, very similar to the idea of meditation, they kind of go together, being mindful of placing my mind to my feet, my attention to my feet, but holding your attention there long enough to bring about changes in the body, whether that's two minutes, three minutes, takes practice. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Let's take the backs of the hands and we're going to exhale as we reach down toward the floor. We're gonna exhale through our mouth this time. We're going to, ah. we're gonna slowly come up, inhale through the nose as our hands come up above our head. And we're gonna slowly exhale through the mouth here as we make a little bit of an H-A sound, a ha sound. When we get to the bottom of that movement, this is the inhale. When we get to the bottom of this movement, we want to exhale a little bit more than what we got in there. Like squeeze it out. Then inhale. And down here at the bottom, we also want to listen to my breath. I go, ah. I pause, then I inhale. I exhale. And then I inhale. Now, it may be helpful for some of you here. Connect the two middle fingers. I'll bring a little bit of focus. This also is good for the pericardium meridian, which is this protective covering related to the heart. And ha is a good healing sound for taking the tension out of the heart, amongst other things. A 
couple more. Uh, a little more. Uh, right from where you are, bring your hands to this lower belly area. Mm, wherever your belly button is, kind of make sure that it's in the middle and you're making a little bit of like an upside down triangle here, okay? So roughly like this, doesn't have to be exact, okay? But roughly like this. You're holding your hands here, okay? And you can uh, move them a little bit to the outside so your fingers are not touching anymore. It's kind of like this, and you're holding, okay? Relax your shoulders, kind of like do this for a second. Try and relax your shoulders while holding this here. I highly recommend practicing this in the morning when you wake up in bed. Uh, it is also powerful to practice from this position here of standing tree uh, meditation. There are many lymph nodes here. Your large intestine is here. What we call in Chinese medicine, your lower dan tian is here. What we call in Japanese martial arts, the hara, where you generate your power and your ki from your striking ability, also your ability to protect your body when you're being struck. The hara lives okay. here. It's the same. In Chinese medicine, it's called lower dan tian. In Japanese martial arts, it's called the hara. Same uh, center, though. Same epicenter and this area of lower dantian can be charged like a battery which also means it can be drained like a battery this area that we're going to hold for approximately another two minutes is also called in Western medicine, the second brain. And it is intimately connected to the first brain. It's also intimately connected to your digestion, which also means that your digestion is intimately connected to your brain. So that means your digestion affects and impacts your mood, your level of stress, how you feel whether you're clear, not clear, so on. So any place in your body, any place in your being where you'd like to be more clear, where you'd like to bring some healing, et cetera, bring your attention there and bring these magical things called hands, if you have them, bring them to the area that you're looking to bring your attention to. Now, get ready. When you're ready to do an inhale, watch what I'm gonna do with my hands. I'm going to inhale and I'm gonna bring my hands around to the back, if that's comfortable. I'm gonna inhale through the nose. I'm gonna exhale as I go down the backs of my legs. If you can go behind your knees, just go that far. If you can go all the way down to your feet, go around the outside, either way. Come up the inside as you do. Inhale as you draw the energy up the insides of your thighs. This goes above your head. If you feel lightheaded, do not do that. Exhale as you sink your body. Draw the energy and breathe here from the belly button, essentially. Exhale. That can be in through the nose and out through the mouth. It could also be in through the nose and out through the nose. We'll get into that later. That's an inhale. This is an exhale. H-A sound again here, inhale. If you're making the H-A sound, then the exhale has to be through the mouth. Inhale, reach, stretch, exhale. You might notice as you're doing this, your inhale bit gets bigger. Your exhale becomes greater. Remember, I said something earlier. Chi, electromagnetism.
rides on your breath. Oh. Inhale as we draw the chi back. We uh, bring the chi down the backs of the legs, bladder meridian. Oh. Come up the inside, which is like liver, spleen, kidneys. We'll get into meridians a little bit later. Exhale. Tell you a little bit about them anyway. Inhale, exhale. Inhale on the up. Exhale on the down. Inhale on the drawing of the energy back. Exhale as you go down. Exhale. Pause slightly on the exhale. Pause slightly on the inhale. Then exhale. Inhale coming up. Exhale, coming down. Inhale. Oh. This is an old Qigong, ancient Qigong exercise called two hands hold the waist to bring strength, healing, to the kidneys. But it does other things too. Here we're going down the bladder channel, which is on the backs of your legs. The bladder channel should be obvious in some cases what that is uh, related to, but in other cases, did you know that the bladder channel and your level of stress is related to your blood pressure? It is. So this is a good exercise for balancing and regulating blood pressure. Up and exhale. Notice how I walk my feet. So I'm like here, I'm starting to exhale. You may notice me cheating and walk my feet. I make my stance a little wider. When we go a little wider, this is called a horse stance. Everybody try that one out for a moment. We're gonna inhale here. We're going to exhale here. Oh. That H-A sound. One more. Oh. Oh. Now, go ahead and walk your feet like this. We'll come back to that uh, practice, say a few things about it, a little bit about the high blood pressure, a little bit about uh, getting grounded, a little bit about meditation, how these concepts come together. Right now, I'm marching, right? This is marching, okay? You're doing this in an aerobics class. You're doing it for one reason, similar reasons, really, but this is a little different. When you are marching, there is an emphasis on the pounding of the floor. Don't do it hard, but I do want you to understand the idea of like pounding or stomping. Just don't do it hard. But it has, in other words, I'm not trying to be light, 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 and I'm up on the balls of my foot. This is a very flat-footed exercise. March, 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 march. Now, you don't want pounds hard enough that it bothers your knees or your shins or anything. You just want like a light tap, light tap, light tap, light tap. Because you have energy centers in the bottom of your feet. You have acupuncture meridians in the bottoms of your feet. You have two major points uh, on the bottoms of the feet called kidney one. Those energy meridians, those points belong, um, they're connected to meridians that come up your legs and are connected to your kidneys. Kidneys are related to things like uh, longevity, things like um, reproduction, things like uh, high blood pressure or no high blood pressure, things like tiredness or energy, okay? Uh, also, senility, as you start getting older, 
people who are losing their memory and different things, kidneys is associated with memory. So this is marching. Now, also, I'm going to turn sideways for you guys at home. So the back of the leg here is called the calf there. And we can stop. Let's pause. Go right back to standing tree meditation. Bend the knees. You should feel some, like, circulation down there in your lower limbs especially, but you, you also through your body. The back of your leg, the calf, is called the gastrocnemius. It is considered a second heart. Go ahead and take your hand, both hands, like so. Close, close, but not tight, relaxed. And then ever so slightly, pump it, open, close, pump it, open, close. It, it not, not hard, nothing with effort, just little effort. This is an excellent exercise in and of itself for working with the hands and preventing arthritis and getting rid of arthritis. Move it or lose it, okay? That's my motto. Uh, keep moving it, okay? Keep moving it, but also I want you to understand, you feel what your hands are doing there? I want you to do this as if you like a pump. It's a pump, 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 pump. Well, guess what? That's what we just did with the gastrocnemius. And the gastrocnemius, your calf muscle, is considered a second heart. And do you know what it does? It pumps blood back to your heart. Why? Well, first it goes to the lungs. Why does it go to the lungs, Carrie? You need to breathe. Because you need to breathe and you need oxygen. It needs to reoxygenate that blood. Everybody, we did that exercise earlier where we tapped. Instead of tapping right now, I just want you to very light, like a, it's not even a massage really, but just like light, like go down your legs for a moment and then come back up your legs. And then just go down your legs, light, very light massage. While you're doing that, I want you to notice something. Your legs are kind of long. Check it out. Go down your legs, regardless of how tall you are. I want you to notice how long your legs are. Go down your legs. Wow, there's a wall. Wow, we got some legs there. Wow, all right, whoa, there's some legs. All right. So go down there, okay? And now come up and then just walk slightly, little, little walk, little walk. Your legs contain a lot of blood. That blood, when you're not exercising, does not go back to your heart. When that blood goes back to your heart because you're moving your legs like this, do you know what that's called? It's called venous return. So when you're walking, the blood from your legs, look at the blood. It's way down there. How do you get it back? You have to find ways to get it back so that you can reoxygenate it because if you don't, you have poison sitting in your legs and sitting in your body, right? So we need to work it and we need to keep it moving. That exercise with the stomping, this is an excellent way to do it. Um, we're gonna go ahead and do a light stretch. Be careful here. Um, so we're gonna uh, just, you wanna bend from the waist. If you're very stiff, some of you will be, you're like this, don't eh, try and reach your toes. Keep your legs straight. If you're very tight, reach and touch your knees. If you can do a little more, then you go a little more. Wherever your end point is, you then begin breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. So I'm just gonna hang here and breathe with you for a moment. You wanna go to that place where it's just slightly uncomfortable and then try and breathe there. And if you can't breathe there, then you need to do a little bit less of a stretch. In that last exercise, if you slowly come up, bend your knees as you're coming up. That last exercise we did where um, two hands, uh, that, that one's often called, this one where we did the breathing and we went down, it's actually often called two hands fold the feet. So like 
you in order to do that one full out like you have to be kind of flexible so it's good to stretch there but if in that exercise where we're doing the breathing and like you can only go to the backs of your knees that's okay then come around to the inside then we did the inhale coming up if you're flexible enough though which is why it's good to stick in a stretch now and then you're actually attempting to go all the way back down hold your heels come around the outside of the foot because that's where the bladder meridian runs and then we come around the inside of the foot and then we come up and we inhale and we exhale, okay? All right, we're gonna go into an exercise here where we're gonna do some twisting, okay? Um, sometimes it's called like knocking on the door of life, I think they call it. Um, we call this one the gentle drum. It's like if you've seen one of those uh, little drums that they have that typically come out of Asia, probably seen them in India too where you swivel it and the little balls on the string bounce off the drum. Well, that's your fists, your hands, okay? And notice here as I'm doing it, okay, I'm lifting my heel. You don't have to lift your heel, but if you lift your heel, you, especially if you're older and more stiff or whatever, you probably won't like it as much with your heel flat on the floor because it puts more pressure on your knees and on your hip joints and so on. So this gives you a little bit more flexibility, a little more freedom. And so as I twist whatever direction I'm going, then I lift the heel going that way, lift the heel going that way. Now my hands are doing this tapping thing. The tapping thing is called in China, they call it Daoin, which basically just means tapping. But you're tapping your body here, wrapping on your body lightly. And this tapping is a technique of self-massage. Okay, it's a self-massage technique. Traditional Chinese medicine has four branches. The West is becoming more familiar with these branches of medicine. One branch you're familiar with is called massage. There's another branch that has gained popularity and uh, is gaining more popularity every day is called acupuncture. And many traditions along with Chinese medicine also have another branch of their medicine called herbs. And of course, in Western medicine, we have medications, the large majority of which are derived from what plants do and what they've learned and discovered about natural medicines. So, um, as well as some other things that I may tell you about later related to the inner workings of the body. Um, I'm sure we'll get to that actually, because it's one of my, one of my things. <laughs> but the fourth form of medicine is one that the large majority of you are not going to be familiar with. And it is the one of the most ancient of those arts and practices. It's also one of the most in-depth practices. And it is said to have given rise to acupuncture. And that is this discipline called medical Qigong. So medical Qigong is a very vast medicine. People ask me often, they say, well, what is the difference between medical Qigong and Reiki? Well, in general, if I'm just a beginning practitioner of Reiki versus a beginning practitioner of medical Qigong. There's some slight differences and Qigong or medical Qigong is primarily uh, based on the same principles as acupuncture, whereas Reiki is not um, to that degree. Having said that, medical Qigong has been around a lot longer and there are volumes and volumes and volumes, all of the acupuncture books, all of the acupuncture disciplines, all of this very, very vast, very, very old uh, form of practice. Reiki is a little more modern, etc. So uh, even though it's not brand new either. Moving, twisting, just going to do this a little bit longer here. If you can lightly tap on your back there, don't hurt yourself, but your kidneys are back there. And if you can lightly tap back there, we're back to that same idea of bringing energy, chi, vitality to the kidneys.
as you're practicing, just notice what is happening with my saliva? What is happening with my breath? What is happening with my blood? Those are things you just want to notice along the way. Because again, as I said earlier here, uh, meditation and mindfulness, being mindful, they come together. And so in be, being mindful about your practices and bringing your attention and your awareness, these are things that are very important when it comes to practices of meditation. We're withdrawing our focus from all that mind and all that energy that's going out into the world distracted by a hundred different things or whatever. And we're bringing all of that attention back to ourselves to some degree anyway. We're doing our best to do that. And we're bringing it back to our bodies and we're learning to work with our bodies and our breath and the different functions of the body that we tend to neglect when we run off to work and sit on the computer from nine to five or whatever the thing is that we do for our job. Um, sometimes we end up neglecting basic function like breathing, basic function like moving and so on. And the organs of your body do not like that. And over time, it will create disease. So inhale, exhale while you're doing this. Inhale, exhale. Wonderful little practice here. Easy to remember, hard to forget. Good for you. Very good for you. Now we're gonna do something very cool. I think it's cool. Uh, we're gonna go from this movement where we've been moving for a while. So if you're still moving or not moving, keep moving because we're gonna go from movement and we're very purposefully going to become still. Now, when we become still, we're gonna do it by going back to standing tree meditation, okay? Um, Keith and Carrie are gonna do it for us right now. I'm gonna keep moving. So watch them go to stillness. They're going to go right to stillness out of this and go right into a standing tree meditation. They let their feet become solid to the ground. Now, it's very important when I stop moving, guys, I'm going to place my mind to my feet. So I let the arms unwind. Boom. I let my butt sink a little bit. Imagine plugging my tailbone into the ground and then I become still. Your mind and your mind's attention has to go down to your feet because you're going to feel a little like spacey and all this from the practice that you're doing. Most people in our society, their mind and their attention is up in their head. We need to place the attention down into the feet. If you've been able to do that, excellent. If you haven't yet, keep focusing there. And now bring your breath to your feet and I want you to inhale through your nose. But as you're inhaling through your nose, I want you to imagine that you're inhaling through your feet. As you exhale through your nose, I want you to imagine you're exhaling through your feet. Now, in this practice, if you're confident with your balance, it is okay to close your eyes. In fact, it is a good thing to close your eyes. If you're not yet confident, uh, confident with your balance, then instead of closing your eyes, just let your eyes gaze. Like don't look all around the room or look this way or that way, just gaze. But otherwise, if you're confident with your balance, close your eyes. And then you're breathing in and out through the nose, but you're imagining that you're breathing in and out through your feet. Inhale, exhale. 
march your feet there just a little bit and we're going to tap that here and then we're going to take a little break so we're going to tap all the way down outside to the legs we're going to come up the insides we're going to go down the outside some of you that aren't used to this may need a little rest at this point so we'll stop pause get some water or tea and we'll have a little conversation, a little demonstration maybe, and then go back to uh, some more practices. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna bring this up here. I'm gonna tap here up the top of my chest, right here underneath the collarbone here is the lung meridian, okay? So you have something going on in your lungs, you wanna clear your sinuses, congestion, cold, so on, you have a cold. Tapping here just underneath the collarbone and okay? opening up the lungs, opening up the lungs, tapping here, tapping in the very center here. This area is also very important. This area is related to what is called your thymus gland. Very, very important in the healing process. I'll save conversations about that for another program, but there's a lot to say about it. I have a lot to say about everything. So it's happening. Taking shoes. I'm going to reach back here. I tend to get stiff from uh, weightlifting and martial arts practice and so on. And so, like, this works pretty good, but I like to literally use this other arm to help assist me because I can get even further back there. And then I kind of like, I'm really able to tap, you know, the shoulder more effectively. I want to teach you another trick there is that you can go flat handed and that's all right. Okay. It's good. You can go flat handed, good. But try the difference with your hand, like a cup, make it um, like bent a little bit like this, like you're holding something. And if you can make a little cup like this, uh, it feels even better here. There. So if I go this way and I'm tapping here. Okay. Good. Now I'm gonna take the karate chop. Very gentle, but a very light tap on the very back of the head. Back here on the very back of the head, there's there's various um, you know pathways here, energy pathways. One of them in particular on the outside of the head, the base of the skull, is a, a acupuncture point called ladder nine. Everybody that I've ever worked on, and I've worked on a lot of people in the last 40 years, everybody I've ever worked on, they're always blocked. It sits right at the base of your skull. So if you go to the back of your skull here, you take your fingers, all your fingertips, and put them in a clump. It, those, those bony structures right on one side to the right and one to the left right there. And that's the general area you're wanting to go to. And then with a light hand here, light, very light karate chop, you're just going and tapping the one side. And in order to get this appropriately, I want to just tap one side at a time. And I want to angle my head slightly so that I can kind of get in there. And if you do this, if you're like stiff, right, it's just going to bother your shoulder. You have to be very light with this. Very, very light. Then go to the other side. You get tired of one side, then good opportunity. You get to go over to the other side. Open this area up. The bladder channel runs all the way down there from your feet, comes all the way up here to you know your head, and it's moving toward the top of your head. And um, and this tapping here, uh, again, this is an area that tends to really get blocked for a lot of people. So um, tapping this area can have a lot of benefits uh, for you, including alleviating headaches and uh, shoulder pain and neck pain, etc. Now I'm going to take my fingertips. And I'm going to tap right on the sides of my head, just above my ear, okay, like around my ear. And then we're just going to break off. We have acupuncture meridians running all along here, the side of the head, and then also up right on the center and the top of the head. So we're just going to tap the head. My fingertips are like this. I'm making like, like tiger claws. And I'm tapping, tapping, tapping the back of the head, tapping the sides of the head coming up to the top. And now the, the um, forehead in the front, I'm gonna be careful around the eyes, but I am gonna go around the eyes. I wanna go right around the eyes. And I'm gonna be very careful as I come in under my eyes, near my nose, I'm gonna be very careful, but I am gonna tap there. 
And then I'm going to come down into my cheeks. I'm going to tap my cheeks. And I'm going to go back to the back of my head again there for a moment. All right. And now I'm going to take my hands. Remember how we did that flicking thing earlier? Flick, 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 flick. Brush your hands. Take your hands go across your face, over your head and ears. And go out. Again. Notice if that's changing your saliva, if that's changing anything for you, your temperature. Those are just indications something's happening. Something's happening. Now, take that like that. Oh, and now, just like that, Christian. All right, and take a breath, go get a little sip of water, have a little sip of tea. We're gonna have a little conversation now, okay? Um, I'm gonna get a little sip of water myself here. You guys can have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Mm. All right. So <clears throat> and you all can move accordingly however you desire. If you want to move a chair over there, so I'm going to be facing this way for a little bit. Um I'll back up slightly. Okay. So Qigong. First of all, let's um I'll do my best to share my education with you um, because my way is not the only way and I have lived my own personal life, right? So I, I only have my opinions and my knowledge. That's, that's all I have. But at this point, after 40 years of practicing, it's fairly extensive. And uh, uh, I'd just like to share some of the angles of approach and contemplations and kind of how I see the bigger picture. So. Qigong essentially means the skilled cultivation of universal life force. That's its general kind of, that's a general concept. Uh, Qigong is very vast. You know, we see things in the United States, people are starting to practice Qigong, and then people say, oh, well, we know what Qigong is. It's, it's this, because this is what this one person does, or whatever. This is what David Kuhn does, so that's the only Qigong there is. No, there's like 3,000 different styles of Qigong. It's very vast and um, extensive. And again, the uh, particular form and approach that I've really gotten involved with, it, well, there's two, there's three approaches, really. I, I, have, to, I have to be clear. Um, there's the medical Qigong approach. This is related to the acupuncture and all of the disciplines that come with traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, put a lot of energy into that particular discipline. I love it a lot and I love to teach it. Why? Because most of us who come to Qigong, we don't come because we're bored on Friday. We come because we're trying to heal something. We'd like to have more energy. We'd like to have less stress. We'd like to heal something specific in our bodies, right? That's, that's why we're here. It's why we come. And that's what drew me to it. I had a severe spinal disease. They said it crippled me by the time I was 30 years old. So it wasn't like I was sitting around bored and like, oh, what's the next best thing to do? I think I'll try Qigong, you know? No, uh, I had to heal something. And I couldn't find healing with all of the other approaches that I was taking. So, uh, you know, I got very interested in this uh, particular discipline. At the same time, I was introduced to martial arts. And uh, because I had the spinal disease and because we moved around and different things, I found myself getting picked on quite a bit. And um, I, I really didn't like that experience very much and uh, getting bullied and so on. And so martial arts uh, helped me to gain some confidence. But the thing about martial arts that... Um, like physically, I was in a tremendous amount of pain and I had all this stuff going on. 
martial arts is very difficult. It's very difficult to heal those kinds of things through martial art. That's the best way I can say that, I think, right? Whereas you probably have much better luck going to yoga. You know what I mean? Martial art, though, gave me the confidence and it also gave me the understanding of breath. And it also gave me the understanding of internal and external power. And much of it, unbeknownst to me at the time, because I wasn't who I am today, I did not know how related martial art and Qigong were. So if you look at one of the most popular styles of Qigong, it's called Tai Chi. And, it's, and a lot of times it's called Tai Chi Qigong. And this particular form of uh, practice is technically a martial art that is also a form of qigong so you have many people who are practicing tai chi from the perspective of qigong i want to do movement i want to do breathing i want to heal my body i want to build my bone density okay and a uh, question here can you suggest practice relating to back pain knee pain yes i will take that question let me just see real quick I'm sure people are asking. Yes, yes. So um, I'll incorporate the, 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 the question there. So, um, so Tai Chi is a form of martial art. Most people do not know it's martial art applications. There are some who do. Okay, we can, we can keep going. Kung Fu, in its most external form, it is a form of martial art. But do you know where Kung Fu started? Kung Fu started at the Shaolin Temple. It is reportedly, uh, uh, it was uh, reported, I guess I'll say, uh, that an entity by the name of Bodhidharma who brought the teachings of the Buddha from India about meditation came to the temple and he saw all of these monks this is a short version of the story, but he came to the temple. He saw all of these monks sitting around and not taking care of their physical bodies. And in their physical uh, approach to also to meditation and then just life, they literally referred to their bodies as big skin bags. They had no interest in healing the body. And they literally sat there in meditation waiting for this thing called nirvana, where they would just achieve some state of bliss like the Buddha did, and then that would be it. And so Bodhidharma came in and said, whoa, 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 you, you, you all are missing the boat on this. You need to strengthen the body because you need longevity, because you need to live to be 120 years old if you're ever going to discover this thing called nirvana, and you all are dying at like 60. And your bones are not good and your skin is not good and da 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 Okay, so all of us come to this for a different reason. But my, my process, again, was I wanted to heal my body, but I also had a lot of mental, psychological issues. I grew up with abuse. I grew up with alcoholism, drug use, mental illness, all of these wonderful, awesome practice opportunities which uh, I, I have been very successful with, uh, but it wasn't for lack of trying. It was, uh, it was, there was a lot of trying, okay? So, and efforting. Uh, but the, some of the, these practices that I'm sharing with you, they have profound uh, uh, repercussions for your whole life. Okay. So when it comes to breathing and when it comes to practicing Qigong, the first thing I told you that's important in the general picture, there is not one way. Okay, there are many ways. Who's the best teacher? The teacher that helps you and that you find some help with. If it's not me and you want to go see one of my friends, Lee Holden or Robert Pang or whoever, whoever helps you, whoever can help you practice what you're trying to accomplish and help you to better understand it. And not only that, but motivate you to practice. I mean, I could sit here and be like, come on, practice with me. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. Who do you show up and study with and keep building upon what you're building? Because without that, you're not going to have success. You, you have to build upon a practice. All right. 
So there's many different styles and ways of approaching it. One of the primary for me is medical Qigong. We're going to relate it to traditional Chinese medicine. We need to look at meridians. We need to look at sounds. We need to look at how we're breathing. These are things we want to incorporate. And we also want this thing in our practice, at least I do, and therefore that's the way I share it with you, specificity. We want to be specific in moments about what we're working with. If it's high blood pressure, or if somebody just asked me about um, back pain, um, sexual energy, things of this nature, right? And we don't have time to get into all of it, but I, I'll give you a, a dose of some of it. All right. First of all, everybody, if you would, with me, exhale your breath. Take a deep breath because that chapter is done. We need to breathe in now. Take a few breaths to digest the new information. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Take your hands like this with me and go inhale. When you're ready to exhale, turn them over and exhale. Now let's get another uh, one of these elephants in the room out of the way. For some people, it's, it's an elephant in the room. Do I exhale through my mouth or do I exhale through my nose? And there's this big debate out there. No, the right way is through your nose. No, the right way is through your mouth. Okay. I will tell you the, the, my best answer to this question. Inhale, exhale. If you want to calm yourself down and become really easy, exhale through your nose. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale, exhale. If you are feeling fear, if you need more energy, if you're feeling stressed, you've already been breathing in and out through your nose and you can't seem to calm the stress down. If you need to get off some excess energy, if you need more energy, to go into a business meeting. If you are going into a business meeting and you feel like there's going to be people there who are going to be giving you a hard time, you need to have some what is called protective Wei Qi energy. Wei Qi means protective energy. The very best creation of martial art, in my opinion, has nothing to do with your ability to kill a person 110 ways, which I could show you how to do. I don't have time right now, but I could show you how to do it. That is not the most important purpose of martial art. The most important purpose of martial art is the idea of protective energy. Not that I need to punch you in the face. Since I learned, since I started studying martial art with my first master at 18, I started before I was 18, but my first master was at 18. 18 years old, started studying with the first master, never got into a fight again. That was it. Never had a reason to prove anybody, anything to anybody. Never had to get into a fight again. I did some competitions and things, but I never got into a fight. Anyway, Wei Qi is the idea of protective energy. I'm just going to make a slight gesture that looks like martial art, right? But if there's no fighting involved, this is technically Qigong. Ha! 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 I'm starting to feel very strong and powerful. I'm not fighting anybody, but I'm starting to feel very strong and powerful and I'm getting really heated up. And all of a sudden I feel like I have more energy than I did a minute ago. Now that's not allowed in certain schools. They'll literally, literally frown on it. They'll say, we don't do that here. Like at the yoga school, they don't typically do that, right? In the martial arts school, they do that and then they fight with it. Anyway, breathing in and out through your nose causes rest and digest, calming. When you exhale through your mouth, it causes energetic protection. It causes a groundedness. It increases a certain kind of energy and heat. 
And uh, again, it's protective in nature. It is also a practice of expelling what you do not want in your body. One of the reasons that karate, for example, um, one of the disciplines that I have two black belts in, um, and then I have a black belt in Korean Taekwondo, which is essentially a form of Japanese you know, karate, but it's Korean. Anyway, one of the best ideas here, simple as I can make it, this is like protective Wei Chi. I teach you this in some of my Qigong classes, okay? I'm just showing you briefly, okay? But when I make a motion like in karate, I go, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do it very loud because I don't want to scare anybody in a hotel, but ha, ah, I make a loud sound and I go, ha, ah, and I go back, ha, ah, ha, ah, ha, ah, ha, ah, ha, ah, ah. First of all, you hear a lot of high, don't you? And this idea of doing this, if I'm not, I'm not hitting anybody, but I could be hitting a punching bag or I could be hitting something, right? But the point is, you're getting rid of the bad. You're getting rid of the toxicity. You're getting rid of the fear. You're chasing things off. So when it comes to the practices that I would teach you in Qigong, every once in a while, I'm going to throw something in that looks like martial art. But now you have an understanding of what that is and why it is. To me, it's still Qigong. And there are certain schools that, again, they do it this way. Some do it that way. Da, 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 da. But it's all sort of a martial arts Qigong meditation smorgasbord. That's what all of these things are. And there's a lot of it to choose from. And what's most important is you find something to practice that makes sense to you that you can begin owning. Because in martial arts schools, for example, you have levels of belts and so on. The main purpose and the main understanding behind this is that a lower belt, like a white belt, let's say, you're just learning. And then the idea is, is that you're building up as you go along. So like in our program, we have like a certification program for people that want to like kind of understand what's my rank, where am I in that? And then, you know, we teach all kinds of stuff like this to the public where it's, it's general. You get a general idea and you practice it for yourself. You take it and make it yours. Okay. Done with that part of the conversation. Take a deep breath here. Go like this. Ah. Gonna go big, inhale. Ah. Ah. And let's take it back to a standing position. So just briefly, for those of you at home, you see this little guy, little acupuncture doll. All over this acupuncture doll are these things called meridians. You have all these acupuncture points all over the body, okay? We also have um, energy systems like chakra systems, so on. The point is the body is very energetic in nature. And if you think about the pathways, let's go into our little gentle drum while, while I, we dialogue this a little bit. This is our movement here we're going to twist and turn okay what are we doing here in general we're moving aren't we we're moving think about any bodily system any bodily system we don't have to be doctors here let's think about it any bodily system based on flow give me one bodily system carried based on flow like health and flow come together if you have this in that system. Give me one name for a system. Movement. M movement, more like, I mean, like, uh, for example, the circulatory system. Oh. What's another system? system? The lymphatic system. Keith, what's another one? Endocrine. The endocrine system. See, these guys have been listening. This is good, okay? These systems in your body and in your being, they operate very well when you have flow. But that's not just a new age spiritual idea. Oh, I have flow. Okay, you can do that. Maybe it works great. But we want to have flow in our blood. So this little marching technique I showed you earlier, this increases flow. 
it increases flow in the circulatory system. It increases flow in the meridian system, which we're not getting totally into that, but I'm told, telling you a little bit about it here today. Um, and we're certainly working with it. And whenever you're moving the blood and you're moving the energy system, you're also working with these things called hormones, your endocrine system. In other programs, I get into much greater detail about the, how the chakra system and what we call in traditional Chinese medicine and Qigong practice, the Dantian system. I'm primarily going to focus today on the lower Dantian, but there's also a middle and an upper. And now these Dantians, I'm going to jump to that. They're related to what are called they mean what, in other words, what it means is it means elixir field. So if I'm a Western doctor and I've only been trained in Western medicine, which by the way, I left that behind. I did a degree in psychology, started working at a hospital as a supervisor and a therapist at a, in a psych hospital, went on to study molecular cellular biology for four years and, um, thinking I was going to maybe go toward medical school, but then I had this amazing thing happen. I healed my spine from all of this traditional Chinese medicine stuff I'd been doing, and then I went a different direction. My point is, is I understand the language of East and West, and in the, West, in the East, we say elixir field. If you go to your regular everyday doctor, they go, please, elixir field. What is that? <laughs> well, check this out. What it is, is this. The elixir field what is an elixir? Well, in general, it's like this potion, right? Well, guess what the endocrine system is? It is filled with potions. That is what your endocrine system, your hormone system is. And within your endocrine system, you have the most powerful cell-to-cell -cell communicators in your body, period, hands down. So, and many medications are built off of the function of what they've discovered within the endocrine system, but they know very little about it, uh, by the way, in comparison to what is yet to be discovered. All right. So in Western medicine, we call the lower dantian what? I said it earlier in the program, Keith. Lower dantian is also called what? Hata. It's also called what in Western medicine? The second brain. Second brain. It's called the second brain. Does anybody know what instrument measures the field? I'm going to get really woo-woo now. It's going to sound like I'm talking Eastern, but I'm actually talking Western. Does anybody know the field of energy that comes off of the heart that can be measured? And how do they measure it? And what is the instrument called that they use to measure what's going on in the heart's energy field? Anybody know what that's called? EKG. Does anybody know what instrument they use to measure this woo-woo energy field coming off of the brain? Anybody know what that's called? EEG. All right. So the electroencephalograph. All right. These fields of energy are sitting right in the epicenter of what? Lower Dantian, middle Dantian, and upper Dantian. Well, in Chinese medicine, they've been talking about that for 4,000, 5,000 years. Some genius around the world came up with the ability to measure that field. But there are people within the Eastern training, including myself, who can sensate those fields and work with them just using their mind, their hands, their intuition, their psychic sense, whatever you want to call it. All right. So my first answer to the question that was asked here, as a specific question was, how do I heal my back? How do I heal my knees? This is part of the question. My first answer is, regardless of what condition you have going on, you need movement. Movement of these different systems. And so this is why any form of exercise is good for you. In our practices, like I said, we do get more specific. There's much more to know. For some of you, you don't need that. But if you're like me and you're trying to heal a spinal disease, you might need every single little piece of it. 
because healing myself was not an easy task. And I had to learn many things and incorporate many things. And when I work with clients privately and so on, uh, there's a lot of things that we have to decipher and figure out. We have to look at, we have to, um, you know, diagnose not in a Western uh, way because we're not allowed to do that, so to speak, but to have our own diagnosis through our Qigong practice of, hey, what's causing this? And as I told you earlier, for example, high blood pressure is not just about the heart, also has to do with the bladder and the fluid that you hold in your body. How much fluid are you holding? Um, how much water are you holding? How much salt are you holding? These kinds of things. So the first answer to how do I heal myself is you need more movement, physical movement. Now, the interesting thing about still meditation, which we're going to go back into here in just a moment, we're going from movement to stillness. The interesting thing about physical stillness practices, physical stillness meditation practices, they create a tremendous amount of movement on the inside of your body, in your endocrine system, in your energy systems, your meridian systems, bringing healing to the organs, etc. So once again, even though we're practicing stillness, there's movement created. So guys, gals, we need to get everything moving. And two ways to do it in general is through certain types of physical movement, but the other way is through certain types of physical stillness. These are very important. So we go from movement here, we stop, we screw the feet into the floor, we drop and we sit our weight slightly. We're going to open up our armpits slightly. One of the reasons for this, okay, they're going to stay still. I'm going to move so you can see me. You see how it looks like I'm making myself bigger? I am. And what this does psychologically and uh, energetically is it's starting to make, over time, you may start to notice that you are a field of energy. You're not just a physical body standing there. You're trying to get into the vibe of being energetic. It happens over time. It did for me. Um, I had no idea about any of that stuff. I had a spinal disease and it hurt like this to stand like this. Well, when I created enough movement in my bodily systems, I started having healing. So one way is to do gentle drum, for example, and move and twist and turn. And in another way is to stop. And this is a form of still meditation. Where did I tell you to place your mind in this particular one, Carrie? Feet. Feet. You place your mind in the feet. Because you need to get your mind out of your head. High blood pressure, stress is caused by being too mental and being up in your head. Has anybody ever uh, been stressed during the course of the week and you went and stubbed your toes, banged your knees, all of that kind of stuff, tripped over something, dropped and spilled your coffee? That means you're ungrounded. This is therefore a practice of grounding and it is a form of Qigong meditation. Breathing in through your nose, but imagine you're breathing in through your feet. Exhaling through your feet. Now we're going to extend that. There is a, just think of the center. I'm going to do it simple. Think of the center of your crotch area, like in the very center. If there was a center point right between the genitals and the anus, this is called CV1, okay? conception vessel one. Anyway, imagine there's a little point there. Imagine you're now breathing in and out through that point. Inhale through the nose, pull that energy up the spine to the brain, exhale, and go through that. But when you exhale through that, be sure to go all the way down into the floor and imagine some of that's like going down through your feet and your legs because you need to stay grounded in this. Otherwise you're going to get lightheaded and feel spacey, all of that.
So the second teaching I'm giving you in this then is movement, both with physical movement, also stillness and breathing and breathing chi into and out of your body, breathing in electromagnetism into and out of your body. The third piece that I'm giving you in terms of how does one heal and where is healing power in the body, it is associated with these three dantians. There's much more to say, but start with the idea that there are three dantians and the most important one for you today and many days of practicing with me. Everyone bring hands right back down here to your lower belly. This is your lower dantian. What did I say this area is like earlier? I said it's like a battery. This battery can become uh, to, a, to a place where it can hold charge and it can also be in a situation where for many people it has lost its charge. If you want to heal your physical body and you want to bring back your sexual energy and your sexual vitality, regardless of whether you're sexual with that energy or not, it is the source of your healing. It is the source of your healing power. In Chinese medicine, we don't just call it qi, we call it jing. It means essence. And if you don't have essence, if you don't have jing, there's very little you can do to build your qi. So jing, essence, is built up here in the lower dantian. Here, just hands are here. You don't have to focus on, you can breathe through your feet. You can breathe through the center of the crotch area there. You can also just be breathing in and out right now, holding the hands in this position and you're doing what you need to do. Great practice right here. Inhale, exhale, focusing on your inhale, exhale. Right now, it's just a calming inhale, exhale, in and out through the nose. This type of practice will change what's going on in your nervous system. It will change what's going on in your blood. It will change what's going on in your brain states, bring you into brain states that are much more conducive of bringing healing to the body as opposed to stress states. So this is also an answer to your question. And if energy is going out all the time in a hundred different directions, you have very little left for your battery. You have very little left to heal yourself. You have very little left to work with. So if you'd like to be healthier, you'd like to get five more years out of your life. You'd like to strengthen your body and not just have it be a big sack of potatoes. Then practice with your breathing, practice with your movement. Practice your meditation in movement and also practice practices like this where for a moment here, a moment there, you're standing still, you're being still. Because in being still, silly as this may seem, but there's studies on it. You're building bone density because your weight is literally being placed on your bones. So your bone density is being built. There's many other things that are happening here, but that's just uh, a few of them. If you want to heal anything in your body, go ahead and relax that. Go back to marching, please. Marching, I told you it's about moving the blood, but this is also, I did not mention, this is about getting grounded. You're doing all these practices. They're going to make your blood and your oxygen levels and so on, nitrous oxide levels, carbon dioxide levels, feel weird. You're going to feel weird. You may feel ungrounded, a little like shaky. So this is a great practice to help you get grounded. This is how soldiers march, don't they? They march like this. It's very grounding to uh, be practicing this particular practice here. Okay. All right. 
gonna do, uh, I wanna show you one more thing and we'll do a little time check, a little check-in, maybe answer some questions, so on. Um, very briefly, and if you were here, we were doing a live program. Um, I'd make this more exciting and show you this in a more challenging way, but right now we're gonna do it really simple. Keith, if you would come over here to this side, please. So very basic idea, actually, I wanted to have Keith do it. So Keith will go here. He's just gonna go in the center. He's gonna to go to his basic uh, standing tree meditation stance, okay? And the first thing I'm gonna ask him to do is not really do his Qigong practice the way he knows how to do it, which is to put his mind in his feet. Instead, I just want him to take his attention and put it up here in his chest and, or put it up here in his head. We're just gonna do a very basic uh, uh, demonstration, give you a very basic understanding here, okay? When people begin practicing uh, Qigong like this, that if, if the teacher says, I want you to become grounded, I want you to put your you know, focus in your feet, and then if there was ever a challenge where somebody's going to come just push on you to see if you're stable, most people will immediately tense up, and by tensing up, it actually makes them very ungrounded. So Keith, just tense up just a little bit here, and let's just see how ungrounded Keith is. Do you see how ungrounded he was? By making himself very like tight up here, he becomes very ungrounded. We have this idea uh, probably around the world, but I've only been to a couple of other countries, but so I don't know what the whole world does. But I know here in the West that we tend to be very ungrounded. We're very much up in our heads and we tighten up. And we actually think that being tight is a source of power up here. And it's actually not. To some degree in certain sports, you can get away with it, football and so on. But even in football, if you are not grounded down here, I used to play football high school. And if Keith is all tight up here and he's relaxed down here, I'm just going to hit him here and he's going to go up in the air. Okay. So when you practice, it's not about making your body tense. You have to learn to, he's going to go bend the knees now a little bit. He has to relax and let his breath go to the ground. It's going to take some practice, but I'm showing you this in case you want to come back and practice because these are the kinds of things that I teach and you're not going to learn it in a day. So if you want the understanding, here's the understanding. In order to be grounded, this has everything to do with the healing that the question was about, how do I heal the pain in my knees? How do I heal the pain in my back? You know, how do I build my sexual energy? You have to have just enough tension here, but you also have to learn how to relax. And it's the combination of those practices. Then from there, we can build upon breath and other things. But mind has to learn to bring its attention down to the feet. So Keith now is gonna bring his mind down to his feet. And let's do this, do the same kind of test. I'm pushing on him here. He may sway or move a little bit in his upper body. That's not the point. The idea is he's like bamboo. He's very rooted in the ground. He can bend here a little and I can push on him and he's way more rooted and grounded. And when I let him go, did he fall over? No, when I did it before, he would have fallen over. So to have this understanding of flexibility, he's much stronger now here. But isn't it interesting, thank you, isn't it interesting that he is actually becoming stronger by relaxing and becoming stronger by just holding a certain degree of attention and, um, and tension in his legs just enough to be able to be there and be grounded. So let me show you uh, one simpler idea, a little practice, and then um, we'll check and see where we're at, have a little question and answer, whatever. So from here, bend knees. Uh, it's, this is harder to do from a basic standing tree meditation and show it to you. So we're gonna make it a little more obvious. Go to a little bit more of a horse stance. This is the same idea. When you go to this stance, some degree of a horse stance, uh, most people will tense their legs and then they start getting tense up here. You want to, remember how we did this earlier? Let the hands drop. Now I'm holding some degree of tension there. Now from here, I want to sway my upper body. I'm just checking the foundation upon which I'm sitting, which is my lower stance. If I need a little reprieve in my legs, because it takes time for your legs to get used to this and get some strength in them, 
I'm going to lean a little toward my right. Notice how my left leg gets a little longer. And then I'm going to lean all the way. My right leg this time gets a little longer. Then I'm going to come back to the middle. Then I'm going to sway a little bit like gentle drum, although I'm not twisting anywhere near as much. I'm going to lean slightly forward. I'm going to lean, be careful, slightly back. I'm going to push off to one side. And push off to the other side. I'm going to come back to the center. My hands will go up, inhale. This is our waterfall. I call this the waterfall. Exhale. We're going to make a little bit of an SH sound. It's good to hear uh, clear stress, um, anger, agitation, energy from the liver. Okay. We go. Shh. Also helps us to focus. Here I like to take a little break. See how my knees are bent? When I go up, they straighten. Not completely, but mostly. And one more. One more. Bring your legs a little closer together. That's a way to play with your center. Move one way, move back, move one way, move back. Bring hands back to this area just briefly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your lower dantian. In many yoga practices, without judging anybody who practices yoga, it's a profound discipline. But in general, the difference, one of the general differences, um, specific reference to some of the practices. With yoga, you have certain uh, practices of yoga where they focus more on like what we would call like say lower dantian. And this is gonna be all your like really deep stretching, for example, right? But then you have other yogic disciplines where there's more emphasis on say like the heart and the head, which would be like middle and upper. The problem with too much emphasis on middle and upper practices, uh, if you don't have the other practices like in martial art where we do similar stretching to yoga, we do certain movements, we stand in horse stance, you don't have the groundedness. And if you don't have the groundedness, in my experience, not only is it difficult to maneuver through your life, it is also very difficult to heal things. So I want you to become aware of this is my lower belly. This is my lower dantian. This is my battery. This is where I need to begin charging. This is where I need to begin uh, bringing my attention. This is where I need to begin building my energy. This is where I need to begin practicing getting grounded. From there, we then move it. Ah throughout our body. From there, we then move. This becomes not only just moving from your arms, this becomes moving from the Dantian. When we did our tapping, everybody tap, you're tapping. This is working with the energy of the extremities to get all that chi flowing. And then when you finish your tapping, for example, then guess what? Come back and hold lower Dantian. Very slowly now, inhale through the nose. Exhale through the nose. Two more times, the same thing. One more time. Now shaking hands like you have water on them and gently, but punching your feet to the floor. This is to get grounding. This is to open up the feet. There's so many answers to the questions of how do I heal my knees? How do I heal my back? You got to do all of this. You got to open up the feet, the energy centers, the feet. You got to get that energy flowing back up through your legs, like pipes to your kidneys. 
Then from there, that's lower Dantian as well. And then from there, you can build upon that. But without that, it's going to be very difficult. Try and go straight to your heart to bring healing in general. It's difficult. There's a lot of uh, stuff out there right now where a lot of folks are really into like, um, again, not judging anybody in their practices because they're all good. But like heart math and other practices are very interested in this idea of connecting what we would call middle Dantian and upper Dantian, which is heart and brain coherence. And then they sort of monitor what's going on on their phone and so on. How is that working? Highly recommend the practice because the practice is one of mindfulness and it's one of becoming more mindful. Okay, so it's a good practice. At the same time, I find it interesting that in the larger spiritual community, there's not as much of an emphasis on lower Dantian. You go to martial, most martial art classes, they're going to emphasize lower Dantian. If you learn to play baseball and hit a ball, there's an emphasis on lower Dantian. If you're playing football, there's an emphasis on lower Dantian. It has to do with building your physical, but not just building your physical, rebuilding and recharging this lower battery, which then can be developed further. Many of the meditation practices that I have done and I have learned, we started with meditation. If you see the Buddha, the Buddha sits there and holds the hand something like this, right in the vicinity of what? Lower Dantian. If you see the Qigong teachers who teach standing tree meditation, there's some maybe that do this, but a lot of times the hands are on the belly. Why? To bring energy back to the lower Dantian. Lower Dantian being what? Second brain. It's not just this brain that is in stress. It's this brain. It's the brain in your gut. The brain in your gut is stressed. And there's many more details about this, but I'm not going to share it with you today. But there's many reasons why this area, very important, and connecting it using your attention. Then from there, we can begin to open up the heart. Because I'm going to give you a very simple understanding, at least how I teach it. Carrie, what would happen, do you think, to the average person if we brought them in here, we gave them no, uh, no connection to their lower Dantian. We didn't give them practices that made them feel physically empowered and also emotionally empowered. And then we just began opening up their heart and bringing out all their trauma. What happens to that person after three days? After a three-day program, I'll tell you what happens, a four-day program, they're extremely raw. And they haven't finished their process. And now many of them are going home without the tools of groundedness to go back to their job, to go back to whatever their thing is. So again, I'm not judging anybody's method, but of all the methods that I've done and seen and all of what I've learned, I begin teaching people about this because most of us do have to go back to a job. Most of us do have to go back to families. And most of us are very interested in building our physical body because that's where most of us are drawn to Qigong because our physical body is somehow bothering us. So we have to learn to work with these. And that's the first place I start you. From there, you get a little deeper in the practice. Now we can start working on, you know, working on the emotional heart and opening up the heart. Okay. Um, so these are some ideas. You all have a seat. You guys get a sip of water or tea. Let's check in. I know we're running out of time, so to speak. Let's see what some of these comments. I'm just going to look at a couple of these comments and see what I can do to um, for raising my shoulders when I use it on. I'm supposed to keep my shoulders down while raising my arms above my head is quite hard to learn. Yes. Okay. So this first question here um, in relationship uh, to this particular subject, um, I answered the other one related to knees and back and sexual energy. That all begins with the lower Dantian. Um, but this one says that um, uh, person's asking about like 
when they raise their, when they, when they go to do a practice where their arms are elevated, right? They tend to elevate their shoulders too. And then the teacher says, you're not supposed to elevate your, your uh, chest and your shoulders. You know, you're supposed to raise your arms. Um, yet yeah, that's easier said than done. If you have tense shoulders and a, and a chest, you're, you're going to lift all that up. Uh, so number one, that's just going to take time uh, to um, change, but I will definitely give you a shortcut in terms of how to begin to change that. Um, the mind, and not just the mind, but the emotional body is holding that up. So if you've ever heard like Eckhart Tolle's teachings, I, I mentioned um, something that Eckhart Tolle, he became uh, famous there back in like 2007 when he went on the Oprah Winfrey show. And uh, interesting, interestingly enough, I was invited on the show about a month before that. Um, I didn't have, uh, I wasn't where I am in my teaching right now. I decided not to go on yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, Missed my boat for Oprah, but maybe maybe Soul Sunday one day. We'll see. Anyway, um, Eckhart Tolle came out with a concept that's new for most people. Uh, he called it the pain body. Okay, So if you read his book, New Earth, uh, he talks about this energetic dynamic and what's going on in this thing called the pain body. Uh, this has been known as the emotional body for, you know, whatever, 2,000, 3,000 plus years. It's typically referred to as the emotional body. Pain body is a great reference, though, helps people understand what that is. Um, so when you do something in your body and your body like freezes up, that's your emotional body. That's what Eckhart Tolle is talking about called pain body. And I don't want to make it too complicated for you, but hopefully it gives you some degree of simplifying. Lower Dantian is connected to your second brain. Lower Dantian is connected to your second chakra. Lower Dantian is connected to this emotional body. It is therefore connected to your pain body. Your mind and your emotions are like this in the same way that your emotions are like this with the tissues of your body. It all fits together. So the question is then posed, how do I work with my emotional body? How do I work with my pain? Eckhart Tolle would... I don't know that he would refer to himself as Buddhist, um, but he is, you know, in general, uh, his practices from my perspective are very Buddhist, a passive practice, a practice of awareness, a practice of exactly what I was talking about. The body's not really super important and we practice awareness and observation. We don't stand up and practice movement and so we stand and we focus on the internal of awareness. Now, awareness, there's a, oftentimes awareness is discussed in, with meditation, and it is discussed from the perspective that says the light of awareness. Because within awareness, within your attention, there is a very powerful light. Now, there's not enough time in a lifetime to get too picky about the practices that you're gonna do. So Eckhart Tolle has chosen his, I've chosen mine. I personally like the seated meditation, but I also like the martial art practice, but I also like the movement meditation, so on, right? Anyway, we all have our practices. So again, I'm not saying one is any better than any other one. I'm just pointing out, which one are you gonna do? So if, if the one that you're into is, is to sit there and just focus on your breath without really ever moving your physical body, if that's for you, it is a very important practice and it's one of my disciplines. It's not the one that I tend to bring to the public. It's the one I do on my own. It's the one I do with my teachers. I tend to bring some kind of movement and so on because most people need 
Uh, they're looking for healing in their body. They need to be there for their kids. They need to be there for their job. They got to do some healing in their body. They're not ready yet to maybe sit against the tree and go the Bodhi tree and become a Buddha. They're not ready yet. They got stuff to do. So, so that practice of sitting and observing and being aware, aware of what? Aware of your thoughts, which are connected to your pain, which are connected to your emotions. Aware of your thoughts, which are connected to your pain, which are connected to your emotions. That's what you're observing. In some spiritual teachings, that's called ego or monkey mind. There's a lot more we could say about that. I want to keep it simple. You know you're physical, right? Everybody here knows you're a physical body, right? Everybody here knows you have emotional capacity, correct? What you may not know is that that's an energy field playing upon your body like it's a guitar. Your emotions are playing on the physical strings of your physical body, which is built like a harp or a guitar. And while you're having um, uh, this tune being played, there's also certain thinking going on, right? Most of that thinking is connected to your past. It's called past thinking, past emotions, past fears, held within the system. Very simply for today, awareness is a higher order of thinking and much closer to who you really are. You're not the physical body. What's the first thing a person does when you... Uh, enter the physical body carry first thing take a breath. they take a breath keith what happens when somebody leaves the body expel the they expel the breath they exhale the breath and the spirit does not come back to the body i've watched it many times so our breath is very intimate with what we would call spirit you breathe in, spirit comes in you breathe out spirit goes out you breathe in you breathe out you breathe in you breathe out Learning to work with the physical body, the emotional body, the mind, higher mind, which we would call awareness, holding itself still. Meanwhile, the monkey mind, ego, past emotion is going like this. Too much of this, you become sick you have to seize. That's as simple as I can break it down for today. Um, so, um, so when we go postures, we do postures, like this is a, called, a, in general, we call it hugging the tree, but traditionally it's called standing like a post. And so um, it's, you hold like puppet strings. This is one of the most difficult Qigong exercises I think there is when I was 25 years old, had the, still had the spinal disease. Um, this was like, I, I couldn't do this for two minutes. I was like screaming. Well, what is screaming? What screaming is your emotional body, this pain body. From a Chinese medicine standpoint, it's all stuck chi. That's it. It's stuck energy. It's stuck chi. It's stuck blood. It's stuck in the lymphatic system. How do we work with it? We need to create movement flow heals but didn't i also say that stillness heals i did but didn't i also say that in stillness stillness creates movement it does it creates very very profound internal medicine dump It creates very powerful, very profound medicine dump via the endocrine system. And this is why I ask you, pay attention to your swallow. Pay attention to what's happening with your breath. Pay attention to how your temperature is changing because the most powerful medicine that I am aware of on the planet lives inside your body and learning to turn it on starts with the lower dantian but yes 
it, it also is related to the pituitary and the pineal. There's other things to say about this, but in general and somewhat specific, it is related to your endocrine system. All right. Let me just look at this last question here. Magnesium for the calf cramps um, in a particular um, uh, uh, liquid solution. Liquid magnesium is the answer to that question for cramping. Uh, any good practice for Parkinson's? Um, in general, again, any disease you could... Uh, tell me about or ask me about. It is always going to have to do with this emotional body. It's always going to have to do with this pain body. It's also always going to have to do with the stagnation that that is causing, the resistance that, is, that it is causing in the physical body. There are specific conditions like Parkinson's where um, there are certain tricks of the trade that you know we would check into. Um, in other words, if I was looking at somebody's body and kind of like going over it, which by the way, um, for whatever it's worth, uh, I, I, I've been doing this for a long time on the level of the mind. Um, you know, my friend is a famous uh, psychic detective. And um, although I've dabbled in those kinds of practices, um, I use my psychic ability for medical intuition and seeing where something is stuck and so on. One of the things that I've seen and heard with Parkinson's disease in particular, although we would want to look at several organ systems and get the chi flowing throughout the body, especially where? Lower what? Lower Dantian. Because then once we can clear that out, get that working, recharge the battery, we can move not only the... Um, energy, but also get the breath to then open up to the heart and sort of unwind the system, okay? But one of the other things I've also heard with Parkinson's, I haven't treated enough people to say 100% that there's truth to this, but I've heard it enough times that I'll mention it. Um, many people have injured like an ankle or a foot, and there tends to be blockage down there in the feet and around the ankles, which means root chakra and down there in the lower limbs. So standing tree meditation, any form of meditation, working with the lower Dantian uh, would be very helpful for something like that. That would be my comment with that. Um, okay, thoughts and suggestions. Why my blood pressure has become low where it used to be uh, 120 over 120 over 80. Well, uh, if your blood pressure is um, uh, too low and you want to increase it, in other words, if it's lower than 120 over 80, uh, that's good. Uh, you know, it's like 110 over 70, like you're good. But if it's too low and you wanted to increase blood pressure, which actually some people need to do, the sound, shh, if you can hear that, because sometimes my microphone will cut it out, but it's an SH sound. And you're basically uh, making a little bit of a forceful pump uh, and making that sound. Like I said, my mic may be cutting it out because it tends to cut sounds like that out. But um, that type of sound pumps uh, energy and heat and so on uh, toward your head and uh, will definitely... Uh, to some degree, increase that um, blood pressure. It doesn't mean that it will uh, take it over the top, but it might bring you to more normal and so on. Yeah. And then so the opposite is true. If you have high blood pressure, that's a sound you need to be careful of. You don't want to be pumping energy like that toward your head. Um, it can be very dangerous, okay? All right, let's go ahead and take uh, three breaths, if you would. Very common question uh, also being asked here about out of time, but uh, why did I become cold today while practicing these practices? So the lower Dantian, and I'm glad we're squeezing in this question here because the lower Dantian, which I didn't really say this part of it, it is typically associated with heat. And whether you have heat in your body or do not have heat in your body. And because it's a battery, 
and this battery holds charge. Have you ever gone over to a battery pack that you plugged into the wall for X amount of time, right? You go over and the battery pack, it's warm, right? When it's charged, when it's not a charge, it's not warm. Well, it's the same with your lower dantian. And uh, you've got, everybody here has gone outside, your nose gets cold, your ears get cold, your fingertips get cold. Um, whenever the core is not heated up, the extremities will get cold, okay? Um, there's all kinds of other things that happen if you have like too much heat and like in Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, we talk about heat from somewhat general, somewhat more specific. Um, we have what's called true heat, which would be like spiritual fire, spiritual heat, essence, energy. And then we have like what's called erroneous heat, where maybe you get too hot, then you get cold, you're damp, you sweat, like, you know, all of these different kinds of things that, that brings in other details. But, it, but in general, when the lower Dantian doesn't have the charge, doesn't have the juice, your hands do not get hot. Keith, did your hands get hot during your practice today at all? Or Dantian or anywhere? Dantian, yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's kind of chilly here today. And we didn't do anything to superheat ourselves up. If we start making sounds like SH sounds, elevate our arms, different things, we hold this for a period of time. These are more challenging practices. You will get way hotter. Ask Carrie. <laughs> Carrie will leave here sometime. I, I don't know what you did to us, but I was just on fire. Right. Oh, yeah. But, but th this is a, uh, you have to understand that those practices, even though I'm not going to make you run up and down a hill, it's uh, similar to that from a Qigong uh, perspective. And I wasn't going to do that to most of you who are meeting me for the first time today. But when you do those types of practices, you, you first have to build your stamina. You start to do your practices. You're going to start getting really warm. Your hands will become very charged. You'll feel much more energy. And then from there, things like the saliva in your throat will move. Your breath will change. Until then, you know, one of the tests, like if you go to the doctors, um, I often use this as a quick example. Um, you know, five years ago or something, my dad had a stroke. Um, they said that he was going to be in a coma uh, ongoing. He would never recover from it. Um, I drove down to Florida and worked on him. And um, uh, I worked on him for two days and I never touched him. I did my magical mystery field therapy. Um, and in doing the field therapy, hands off, totally hands off, um, I started watching. He started having different responses that I am used to seeing, which are related to rest and digest, parasympathetic rest and digest in the body. Saliva started moving. That tells me his lymphatic system is moving, et cetera, et cetera. They said that Monday morning, they were going to do a swallow test. If he didn't pass the swallow test, they wanted to put a tube in his stomach. Um, <laughs> not he never got to take the swallow test, the official swallow test, because Monday morning he sat up in bed and said, when are we going home? He had tubes in for feeding. He had tubes in for breathing. He had tubes for blood, the whole nine yards. After two days of working on him, it might have been three. Um, he literally sat up in bed literally a half hour before the, the swallow test. And literally, the doc caused everybody to scramble. The doctors, everybody was scrambling, scrambling, scrambling. And this Qigong medicine is, is bizarre on the level that it is. Like I said, I'm doing the best to bridge the gap of understanding here, um, explaining certain things to you. But uh, like medical Qigong, when we do healing work and stuff, it's a form of field therapy. And as bizarre as it is, you know, gravity reaches from here to the moon. Um, when you focus on people from a distance with any form of quote unquote prayer or intentioning or energy work that you use, wherever your mind goes, that energy is going to follow. Um, there are studies of changing, uh, you know, the molecular structure of water. Just check out Dr. Emoto's work um, just by simply saying a certain thought over it. Your body is largely made up of water. You know, if you're interested in ideas like that, check out my book because I talk all about these kinds of things. Try and empower you with this knowledge that, you know, for example, just that one idea, you're a walking bag of water. So what are you saying over it? What are you breathing over it? What, are you, what sounds are you making over it? What are you exposing it to? These are all things that, you know, with 
enough positive, you can create a momentum that can make uh, a big difference in your life. But that field therapy, I had a, a mechanical engineer and also a physician uh, come and see me here in Wilmington, and I treated him, and um, I never touched him. I sat at his feet. I never, I never laid a finger on him. I didn't touch his forehead. I didn't touch his seventh chakra. I never touched him. When the session was over, he said to me, well, first of all, in the middle of the session, about three quarters into the session, he's, he's doing this. He's vibrating. You can see the look on his face. He's in a little bit of a panic. What, what is going on? You know, I'm like, you're all right. I'm like, just stay with it, you know? So we finish. He asks me, can I, um, he says, first of all, I have no idea what just happened here. <laughs> and uh, he said, it feels amazing, but like, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, can I uh, inspect your table? He wanted to inspect my massage table. I said, sure. He goes, I'm sorry. I'm a physician. I'm a mechanical engineer. I have to like check this out. You know, I'm like, go ahead. He's like, is there a heating pad on the table? I said, no. He said, is there, is it hooked up to electrical charge in any way? I said, no, he pulled that whole thing apart. He took the sheet off. He took the underneath the wrap. He tipped the table up. I literally went to the restroom. I'm like, I'm going to go to the restroom. You, you know, go mm -hmm. right ahead. I came back. He's sitting there. He says, I have no explanation for what just transpired right here. None. He says, I'm a scientist. This and I have no explanation for just for what went on. Um, they've been able to measure these frequencies of uh, Qigong masters in China um, from things I've read and so on. Um, and there is a significant voltage coming off of people who have the ability to do this. They can also measure the temperature coming off of uh, Qigong healers' hands in the form of infrared. And the, inf the temperature of that infrared is uh, very high um, in comparison to normal temperatures. So your mind is way more powerful than you realize, and uh, your body is way more energetic than you may realize. And even physicists have uh, the ability now to photograph the body and point out that it is not physical. And yet somehow these liquids and everything else are sticking together in, in some kind of form and for some reason, this form is not spread out all around the room, and they cannot figure out why. So string theory is one of these theories of like, how does this all come together? You can check that out. I won't try and explain it. Uh, so, uh, yes. So last note. Then, first of all, thank you all so much for practicing with me today. You know, you could be doing other things, etc. Hopefully, I gave you a good taste of something, some tools um, to practice. If you're brand new and you're looking for the next step, um, I personally would recommend two things. One is we have something on our site uh, called 21 Day Qigong Challenge. It literally starts out with 10 minutes a day, takes you through exercises like this, and literally like 10 minutes every day for 21 days. We just like go through this. And by the end of the exit, by the end of the 21 days, you're starting to put it together and you have a little bit larger practice. It's a really good place to begin if you're like a total beginner. Second to that is, is if you go to my YouTube channel and you just look up Qigong Awareness and you should find it by that. But if you don't, you can add my name to it. Um, I have many free videos on there. Uh, one of the ones that I would point you in the direction of specifically is I have a 20 minute routine related to the eight brocades, which is a, uh, uh, an old set. Um, and I did a program, Lee Holden interviewed me last year. I was on the shift network um, and I taught that uh, on that interview as well. I taught that eight brocades. I'm a big fan of that uh, particular set. Um, so those are two places that I would uh, turn you on to, and that should give you a taste uh, of these types of practices. And then maybe sometime in the future, if you tune in a little more, or whatever, come back and see me. There's many uh, still practices and meditations and stuff that we can do. Uh, conversations about mindfulness and awareness and the pain body, so on. Um, so I guess the three things, like I said, I would just leave you with pick and choose as you desire, but it's hopefully giving you a breadcrumb. Um, April Cades practice, it's on YouTube. 21 Day Qigong Challenge, it's on our website. 
And thirdly, if you're interested in the mindset and some of the science, general science, because if I, I wrote this book in my spare time while traveling the country and teaching, if I took the time to quote all the science that's out there, I would, I'd still be writing this book. So instead, I just pointed you in the direction of you may want to check out this person's book or you may want to check out that person's book. But I try to empower you with the knowledge that says, hey, you're mostly water the power of the mind, da, 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 da. All right. Thanks everybody so much. Uh, this will be up on YouTube as well, by the way. So, uh, you know, by tomorrow or something, I'll have this up on YouTube and you'll also be able to go back and watch this, go through it um, at your leisure. So thanks everybody very much. Thank you all. And we will see you hopefully next time. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Oh, I'm getting a round of applause over here. Love it. <laughs>